Let's start. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I would like to welcome all the participants uh, in this uh, lecture uh, to this annual Ben Bynard Memorial Lecture. Um, special welcome to the main speaker, um, Dr. Rachel Adams, uh, who is from uh, Research ICT Africa. Uh, I believe um, um, you joined recently. Uh, but previously from the Human Sciences Research Council. Um, also, the panelist, uh, Dr. Divine Fu, uh, Director of Humor at UCT, uh, and Ms. Tanvia uh, Jiwa, who is a UCT alum and contributor to the faculty's intellectual property unit. Um, this uh, uh, lecture is entitled uh, decolonizing AI, ethics, and the rule of law. It's very topical, uh, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Um, the Ben Bynard Memorial Lecture is uh, named after, as the name suggests, uh, Professor Ben Bynard, uh, who um, was um, someone who worked in the Faculty of Law for a long time. He held the W. Schreiner Professor of Law uh, chair at UCT from 1950 to 1974. Um, he's someone who believed and loved um, Roman Dashlow. Um, and uh, during his time at UCT, he played a leading law role in the administration of not just the Faculty of Law, but the university um, as a whole. Now, um, 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 he is said to have been an idealist who was also at the same time a realist. Um, Professor um, uh, Barry Dean, who is a former dean of law, uh, uh, describes him as someone who was uncompromisingly honest, acting always with the highest standards of propriety and integrity in both his personal and academic life but always tolerant and re ready to see both sides of the question um, and to respect the views of others, even those with whom he disagreed. So <clears throat> this year, we had planned uh, a different uh, way of uh, conducting this um, uh, memorial lecture. lecture. Normally, we would have uh, a person um, who is eminent, uh, knowledgeable in a particular field of law to uh, lead the lecture. Um, we would have had a hybrid event, um, and, and, and so they would have been on campus or at least in-person component of the uh, lecture and then the um, virtual bit of it. But due to the onset of the new, what appears to be the new wave of the pandemic, we canceled all of that. Uh, perhaps we are as uh, afraid as uh, our colleagues in the West, um, uh, but uh, we couldn't uh, take a chance. So our apologies for that. Um, uh, you will notice that unlike before, we had one person um, to give the lecture. This time we have um, the um, Dr. Adams um, giving the lecture, but there will be a panel discussion after that. So it's a change in format, perhaps in keeping with the topic um, that we are discussing. This event is uh, generously sponsored by uh, Weber Wenzel. And we have a representative from uh, Weber Wenzel, whom I would like to recognize, uh, Mr. Adam Ishmael. Uh, at this stage, I will hand over to um, uh, Professor Tobias um, <coughs> Schoenwetter to uh, introduce Dr. Uh, Ratio Adams. Thank you very much, Dean, for this introduction. So I've been asked to moderate this session, but I, uh, I'm planning to be a pretty hands-off moderator this evening, really confining myself to a bit of a supporting role here uh, in the proceedings, making sure that we, that we keep to time and that, uh, that the Q&A session towards the end in particular is, is managed in, in one way or the other. But I want to make it very clear, perhaps from the outset, that I'm personally very excited about the topic of, of this year's Ben Bennett uh, Memorial Lecture, not only because it's super topical, as, as the Dean already mentioned, 
um, but also because the questions and issues which will be raised tonight um, are exactly the kind of issues uh, that the new Antarctica Center for Law and Technology and its affiliate LawTech Lab wish to tackle. Now, I also want to just start off by apologizing again for the last minute move from what was supposed to be a hybrid mode uh, to an online only event. Uh, as you heard from the Dean, this, this is of course thanks to, to Omicron and, uh, and the rising numbers of, uh, of COVID infections in our country again, and we really wanted to, to play it safe and, and thank you for, for moving with us, and especially those who had planned to, to come through to the faculty and we're looking forward to, um, to engaging uh, face to face with one another. The speaker certainly, uh, speakers in fact would have enjoyed to uh, to engage in some form of face-to-face -face interaction. I sense that in our in in our preparation, and and we would have really loved to meet and uh, and talk to some of you, you in person. We had organized some catering. We had to cancel last minute with the cater caterer yesterday. Um, so so apologies for that. It's not not perfect. Also to discuss a topic like the one that we are discussing today. I would think remotely, but then again, I guess we are all pretty um, uh, video conferencing savvy by now, and we will surely make the most of, of, of this all. Um, the Dean already mentioned that, that we are departing a bit from how this event ran in previous years, and that we will not only have uh, the, the normal, so to speak, 30 to 40 minute lecture today, but that that lecture then will be followed by an expert conversation of about 20 minutes or so, and we will then open up for a 15 minute Q&A uh, session towards the, uh, the end. Um, I don't have a lot of uh, general other housekeeping remarks, really, apart from perhaps a reminder. You will have noticed that uh, at the beginning, if you joined uh, a couple of minutes be before we started, that this uh, session is going to be uh, recorded. Um, and that questions and comments uh, can be submitted in the in the chats uh, um, on on the side. Um, so if you, if you haven't enabled your chat functionality, please do so now. You can submit your comments and questions really throughout, but we will only get to to uh, to them in the in the Q and A part towards the end. And there's also a risk that we will actually not be able to address all of the questions and comments that are posted in the chat. And we are still trying to find a way of addressing some of them perhaps afterwards. Now. I will introduce the other two experts um, after Dr. Rachel's lecture, and all I'm left uh, with for now really is to introduce our main speaker for, for tonight, Dr. Rachel Adams, um, and this is how her um, bio goes. So Dr. Rachel Adams is the newly appointed, as you heard, principal researcher at Research ICT Africa, which is an African think tank that has operated for over a decade to address questions of digital inequality. In her role at Research ICT Africa, Dr. Adams will direct the AI4D, Artificial Intelligence for Development, Africa Just AI Center. Uh, she previously held the position of Senior Researcher, Civil and Political Rights at the South African Human Rights Commission and was before her move to Research ICT Africa, a Chief Research Specialist at the Human Sciences Research Council, as you heard earlier. Dr. Adams holds a BA degree in English Literature from the University of London, an MPhil in Human Rights Law from UCT and also a PhD from this institution. Dr. Adams is an editor of the South African journal on human rights and um, has published widely in areas such as AI and society, gender and AI, transparency, open data, and data protection. She is the author of Transparency, New Trajectories in Law, which was published by Routledge uh, in 2020, so last year, and also the lead author of Human Rights and the Fourth Industrial Revolution in South Africa, published by SHRC Press um, earlier this year. And with that, over to you, Rachel, and thanks again once again for joining us tonight and doing this lecture for the law faculty. I'm certainly looking forward to it. And I'm leaving my video on because I think you had asked that you can at least see some people if that is okay while you're talking. Thank you so much, Tobias. Um, and thank you also, Professor Chira. And thank you also to Gabby, who I know has done an, an awful lot amount of, of work to, to put this together and to put this together in, in this format, because we had hoped to at least host part of this in person. Um, but, but thank you for the work that's gone into this. It's really such an honor to be back at my uh, alma mater, where I did my master's and, and, and PhD studies. Um, and UCT law faculty was was a really important place for me to kind of think critically um, about the world we find ourselves in and the world we construct. Uh, and that's part of the point of today's talk is to, to provoke thought about the impacts and implications of what is perhaps a new area for some of you, artificial intelligence, but others of you may be working in related areas and disciplines. 
Um, I'm going to cite various works throughout the talk, and if you are interested and want any more information or, or want to get in touch, particularly if you're a student and you're interested in doing research um, in this area or in a related area, then please do get in touch and, and I've got various resources that, that might be of interest to you. So uh, I'm going to start. Thank you once again for being here and, and looking forward to engaging with, with Divine and Tanvia uh, after this um, sort of 30 minute or so uh, input from my side. So artificial intelligence is structurally, systematically and psychologically altering not only local and global society, but what it means to be human or what it means to be counted as human. AI is a very broad idea. It is so broad and so ideational. It may be thought of as an ideology. It is too one of the major aspects of 21st century living, shaping our social interactions, access to services, and monitoring almost every aspect of our online and public life. AI encompasses a vast and expanding network of computer-based technologies that require uh, indefinite uh, and, and non-stop input from data and seeks to display human-like intelligence and functioning and even superhuman-like intelligence and functioning. It involves a mega industry that operates at a planetary scale with a footprint in almost every corner of the globe and an infrastructure that is both subterranean and celestial, extending to the deepest parts of the Earth's ocean with data stored under the sea and submarine cables linking together the world's continents and circulating into the outer atmosphere of our cosmos with satellites and drones. Recently, calls to decolonize AI have arisen across the world, championed by critical scholars of AI or from indigenous groups from Hawaii to New Zealand that are practicing and developing AI techniques and technologies on their own terms. These calls echo a growing global con consciousness to attend to the debris left by the European empires of modernity and two, responds to increasing instances of, of injustice and discrimination arising within the AI industry, discipline and practice, which bear the mark of racial inequality and settler dispossession. Such instances include the takedown of anti-colonial and anti-racial content from social media platforms, as we've witnessed recently with the complicity of Twitter and Facebook in Kashmir, Israel, Palestine, Myanmar and many more. Myanmar and many more. Although not well evidenced and certainly hard to trace, the algorithmic organization of content on social media platforms has ostensibly played a role in exacerbating ethnic and political tensions in countries across the global south in particular. Uh, there's a recent report from the continent, um, I think, you know, just, just last month on Facebook's role in fueling the violence in Ethiopia. Yet the big tech companies involved uh, deny culpability and refuse to participate in judicial inquiries. We've seen this with the case of Myanmar, where Facebook relied on the notion of privacy to prevent access to the records of the Facebook posts of key Myanmar officials that were requested by the Gambia in order to build a case for the International Court of Justice. There are many other instances where AI has demonstrated critical racial biases in particular, to the extent where we must consider whether the technology itself is inherently racializing. And I'll come back to this point later. Such instances include AI powered algorithms, which repeatedly misidentify individuals or make inaccurate and stereotyped assumptions about anticipated behavior, whether the ability to pay back a loan or the likelihood of committing a crime. And these systems have demonstrably affected those historically oppressed by slavery and colonialism, now automating the discrimination and inequality that such histories first introduced. So Ruha Benjamin's uh, book from 2019 called Race After Technology and Simone Brown's On the Surveillance of Blackness are two excellent texts here for understanding this phenomenon more deeply. At a more general level, Questions of decolonization have arisen in relation to the will of big tech companies to commodify all human experience as data points that feed insatiable AI systems and which require ever more data input in order to boost their efficiencies. 
Nick Caldry and Ulysses Mayhas speak of this as data colonialism, and they explore how human experience itself is being appropriated as capital in an increasingly data driven market. Yet these processes are as political as they are capitalistic. It's politics, it's hegemony, it's industry monopoly. But the state does not have monopoly over the politics and industry plays a part in the diffusion of hegemony. Indeed, AI requires a polymorphous state industry nexus, the permutations of which look different in differing contexts, making the central imperial power very hard to locate. In the totalizing mission of this AI complex, peripheral ways of living and being are threatened, including the extinction of indigenous knowledges and languages that cannot be computed, at least not by the dominant languages in which artificially intelligent natural language processing is coded for and written. But this complex, despite being largely unseen, is sustained by an expanding web of material resources spreading out across the planet. The infrastructure, hardware and bodies required to build and grow the AI empire and which are extracted in practices which mimic historical patterns of colonialism. So decolonization, as I'm sure we're going to speak about in more detail following this input, is, is a refracted term, depending on who is speaking, where you're speaking from, and all the context that informs the speaking moment. Decolonial thought is, of course, far more than a tool to problematize AI. Instead, it is an invocation to make sense of, invalidate and abolish the logics and politics of race and coloniality, that can continue to exclude and degrade other ways of knowing, living and being that do not ascribe to the hegemony of imperial reason. It is an insurgent political strategy against colonial power in all its forms and modalities. To understand what decoloniality must counter, we must understand the nature of the extreme power colonialism built and introduced to the world. This is a power over, a deathly power of denial, injustice and negation. It is a power that denies the freedom, dignity and very humanity of those it oppresses and takes this to bloat the supremacy of those it serves. It is a power whose effects are fundamentally de-equalizing, and I take this word from Annabel Crigiano, where equality means the recognition of the intrinsic human worth of every life. The modalities and effects of this de-equalization, as they have arisen from historical colonial practices, is precisely what decoloniality must then attend to. As the French Algerian critic of colonialism, Albert Memmi describes, colonialism created lasting conditions of poverty for the colonized and an impoverished impoverishment of the mind that affects both the colonized and the colonizer. But race is colonialism's central creed, an invented marker of human difference and worth. And gender, distinctly Western and binary notions of gender, is the technology through which race and the fundamental de-equalization of humanity is produced through the generations. In its ultimate form, colonial power over became apartheid and the creation of what my colleague Shepo Matlingozi names a world of apartness. So formalized here in South Africa, worlds of apartness are continually created and upheld in regimes of de-equalization. That is systems and structures of racial and gender bifurcation that mark, divide, categorize, classify and hierarchize individuals according to social norms of undesirability. My work then has been to explore AI precisely as one of these new regimes of de-equalization. So within this context, um, and, and I've been working in this area for some time and, and plan to do much more work in this area, I consider AI as an imaginative device to achieve and consummate the ultimate superiority of humankind over its world, and therefore radical extension of what colonialism began. In fact, AI can be thought of as providing the colonial machine with the tools to run smoother, to conceal its operations and fix its subjects in states of privilege or oppression that creates greater bifurcation and hinders the possibility of a post-colonial human community to come. 
So in this talk today, I'll be exploring just a couple of the facets of AI that critically intersects with the histories and effects of colonialism. The first, its relation to the construction and reification of race. And the second, the role of ethics as the key regulatory framework that's been promulgated to address the harms associated with AI. So AI systems sought personal data and data according to socially ascribed normative markers. At times, these markers are directly racialized or gendered, such as a system that seeks to allow only women to enter a female changing room. Other times, these markers may be implicitly biased, such as targeting systems for advertising or even policing based on postal codes. Such systems work by classifying, sorting and ranking personal data through processes of data collection, curation, labeling and annotation, using advanced statistical methods for modeling distribution and measuring correlation in order to both calculate risk, predict behavior, and also to optimize the system's own functions. So it's always self-serving in some way for the AI system. These statistical systems have their history in colonialism and were developed and appropriated within former colonies to control and, co and divide colonial people and lands. Keith Breckenridge from BITS, his seminal book, The Biometric State, explored these histories within South Africa and the use of statistical instruments following Galton's work in the region, the key kind of figure in the history of statistics and later a proponent of eugenics, to monitor and control the native population. Enumeration and the production of statistical knowledge in the colonies performed a number of functions, including entrenching and policing colonialist binaries of colonizer, colonized and their derivatives, but also in enforcing divisions between colonial populations and as a form of remote colonial rule. On both a structural and individual level, these colonial archives functioned as a kind of palimpsestic form of abstract representation, which fixed the ontology of the colonies and its people by Western knowledges. In a similar way, the data assemblages of today work to fix individuals into socially ascribed markers such as gender and race, but also very specifically socioeconomic brackets by taking their data as a sign or even the only sign of the real. Writing of forms of representation at work within systems of racism, Achille Mbembe speaks of a will to representation being at bottom a will to destruction, aiming to turn something violently into nothing. In this way, to constitute something in the form of something else, something more manageable and more malleable to forms of racializing power, consists of an essential and violent erasure of the original. Imperial knowledge practices based on abstract and racialized representations, such as the statistical instruments for population control and new forms of artificial intelligence, constitute not only a way of dividing the self from others and from itself, but also work to erase those who fell on the wrong side of the dividing line through substituting them with their representation. Comparably, Simon Gikanda chronicles the slave master's fastidious record keeping of the behavior of their slaves, such that this archive of data came to constitute the evidence of the latter's objectification. That Simone Brown now writes of data driven surveillance systems being to put to work to surveil and bound black lives as exacting the self, its body and behavior to testify as objective evidence against itself holds then a critical provenance within the history of the management of blackness from slavery and colonialism. The effects of these systems, which now include AI-enabled biometric technologies in airports and public spaces, is, as Simone Brown describes it, to reify structures of racial difference, producing and reproducing the racialized self. Some of the most advanced biometric systems in the world today, which are far more common than we think, utilize facial recognition technologies within their technological makeup. These technologies function by reading the signatures of human faces, such as the distance between facial features and comparing the image to an expansive database of human faces in order to de uh, detect physiognomic patterns by which the machine then makes sense of the social status, gender, race, age, sexuality, and so forth, 
of the person whose face is being read. While these practices work to enforce social stratification and reinscribe racialized hierarchies, this repeats too the very logics of race and racism to deduce from signs and surface appearances who an individual is and what they can do and be in this world. Race science legitimated this logic through the production of knowledges that sought to evidentiate the link between surface appearances, skin colour, facial, facial features, skull size, and inherent cognitive abilities and behavioural traits. Today, facial recognition technologies powered by AI employ similar practices in measuring facial diameters and expressions as a means of inferring intent, predicting behaviour and even understanding intelligence. Perhaps more critically, these systems provide the tools with which to allow for the return of race science under the guise of securitization, market efficiency and risk management. I'm now going to turn to the frameworks that are being considered and adopted globally as a means to address the harms that, that AI is seen to produce. As Timnit Gebru, who is a leading figure in, in, in critical studies on AI, has pointed out, Ethics is the language du jour in AI discourse, a notably self-regulatory measure. Ethics and law have, however, historically been the basis from which Europe claimed to differentiate its supremacy from the rest. In this rendering, the idea of ethics is situated as a value supreme of Europe, for zealotized on the colonies, which are in turn, and in relation to the ethical West, positioned as what Mbembe has called pre-ethical. Indeed, that Europe believed itself to be helping and protecting its colonies constituted the dominant rationale of the civilizing mission of colonialism with ethics as its veneer. This served two functions. First, to justify colonialism itself as Western benevolence. And second, in rendering the colonies as pre-ethical, the West could use these places as laboratories for scientific progress without guilt where the collateral damage of scientific advancement could be safely imbibed in places and by people considered expendable. In an echo of colonial sentiment, the ethical and legal standards for AI that are arising largely from the West are considered, also by the West, to constitute its critical edge in the AI arms race that's largely being led by the US and China. Little, little critical thought has been developed, however, around the idea of ethics itself and the work that this term has played in justifying colonial violence. That decoloniality is now appearing as a new critical edge within the AI ethics discourse poses another concern. Should decoloniality be subsumed as a new tool for AI ethics without critique of the way in which the idea of ethics has been historically put to work in rationalizing colonial practices, it runs the risk of appropriating decoloniality as an abstract metaphor and reperforming the very problematic outlined by Eve Tuck and Wayne Yang uh, in terms of recentering whiteness. In 2019, a highly cited study was published in, in Nature, identifying over 84 ethical standards that have been developed for the use and development of AI globally. Despite being titled the Global Landscape of AI Ethics Guidelines, among these 84 AI ethics standards, none listed are from the African continent or even the global south. Most were developed in the USA, UK or by international bodies. As benchmarks for ethics, these standards being developed are paternalistically positioned as universal, applicable for all everywhere. In addition, in order to ensure the fairness of new AI technologies, that is the extent to which they exhibit social biases in particular, instances are arising that demonstrate these technologies first being trialed in the global south or appropriating more representative data from African populations in particular in order to boost the accuracy of the algorithms in detecting non-white faces or data points. Now very well documented, um, in 2008, when issues around racial bias by AI-driven facial recognition technologies peaked, following the critical work of Ghanaian data scientist Joy Bolamwini and Ethiopian data scientist I mentioned before, Timnit Gebru, a Chinese facial recognition company signed a deal with the Zimbabwean government 
to access the records of the National Population Registry, which contained pictures of the faces of millions of Zimbabweans. This was part of a broader strategy being offered by the Chinese development arm to support Zimbabwe in establishing a digital ID system prior to the elections. This data was to be used as learning curricula to train the company's algorithmic technologies to more accurately recognize black faces. In reducing the potential for bias, the system would ultimately be more ethical. While Balim and Keith Breckenridge condemned this incident for exploiting the inadequate data protection provisions in Zimbabwean law, it is too not all that different from the practices noted briefly by Mohammed, Ping and Isaac around beta testing newly developed AI systems in African countries. Known as ethics damping, Mohammed, Ping and Isaac cite as an example the piloting of Cambridge Analytica's infamous election propaganda data systems in Nigeria and Kenya prior to their refinement for use in the 2016 US elections. This follows the now centuries old conceit, colonial conceit of what Jan Smuts at a lecture at Oxford University in the, in the 1930s euphemistically called the laboratory of Africa where scientific experiments could be carried out with little to no moral concern for local communities. In the instances described above, the idea of ethics is situated as a value supreme of the Occidental world to be proselytized on the supposedly pre-ethical African region. Yet, as ethics was put to work to both justify the civilizing mission of colonialism and the utilization of Africa as a laboratory for Western scientific progress, it performed another conceit of the colonial order of things, that Western reason was neutral, universal and objective and could and should be dislocated from the context in which it arose and applied elsewhere. Positioned then as a point zero from which to survey the world, Western knowledge and rationality claimed an irrefutable ascendancy to offer the only real way of knowing and understanding the world. This is a critical problematic named within decolonial thought by people like Ross Fugel and Undeluve Gaccheni, an essential assumption within AI too, that intelligence and the production of knowledge can be outsourced to a machine presupposes such knowledge to be both separable from the context in which it was produced and applicable to other contexts and realities. Alternate frameworks are, however, beginning to emerge. Mohammed Ping and Isaac advocated for dialogue between the AI metropoles and peripheries as a means of developing what they call intercultural ethics. They write that dialogue can facilitate reverse pedag pedagogies, wherein the metropoles can learn from the peripheries and that intercultural ethics emphasizes the limitations and coloniality of universal ethics dominant rather than an inclusive ethical frameworks and finds an alternative in pluralism, pluriversal ethics and local designs. Sabella Mahlambi has taken this a step further by developing a framework for AI based around the notion of Ubuntuism and details how the notion of the relationality of personhood offers an important framework for addressing some of the major challenges around data exploitation and that idea of data colonialism. Thompson Chingeta, a legal scholar, is also exploring the notion of freedom ethics embedded within Article 9 of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights as a critical legal touchstone for responding to the challenges posed by AI-driven autonomous weapon systems which is currently largely being considered within the more Western legal frameworks of international humanitarian law rather than human rights law. So just to kind of wrap things up, decolonial thought is obviously far more than a tool to problematize artificial intelligence and its affects. It stands as an invocation to make intelligible, to critique and to seek to undo the logics and politics of race and coloniality that continue to be put to work in technologies and imaginaries associated with AI in ways that exclude, delimit and degrade other ways of knowing, living and being that do not ascribe to the hegemony of Western reason. 
It is located and it is specific. It is about the production of race in divided worlds. It is about power and the precise effects of power on being in the world today. It is about knowledge and how knowledge is ascribed legitimacy and value. And it is about a politics of resistance that enters and, as, and does the object of its critique. This includes, as I outlined above in relation to ethics, the discourse that rationalizes and obscures the history and effects of AI. Decoloniality also suggests its own fulfillment in the realization of a world where the lasting power and power effects of colonialism have been truly reckoned with and abolished and a new form of human government that inhabits a true human community of the world installed. But what might this look like and what kind of ethics is required to transcend the self-concerned individualism promoted by AI today? This is particularly important given the radical and dangerous individualism and complete human autonomy for some groups that AI is making and seeking to make possible. In engaging these questions, we, we can consider what the true ethical concerns of AI are, some of which I've tried to outline here, and how decoloniality can help us articulate and address them. For Franz Fanon, ethics was lived in the native's refusal of the ways and ideas of the colonial. He writes, no professor of ethics, no priest has ever come to be beaten in his, the native's place, nor to share their bread with him. As far as the native is concerned, morality is very concrete. It is to silence the settler's defiance, to break his flaunting violence, in a, world, in a word, to put him out of the picture. The violence Fanon calls for is constitutive to the creation of the new decolonized world. This violence, as is all violence, is essential. It takes place in the violation and transgression of human law. Fanon's call for violence holds a deep importance that is central to the task of decolonization. But in the context of the often hidden violence of AI, in the slow, automated violence of its sorting and divided systems, our task then is to consider what counterviolence is needed to break free from its bonds. I'm going to end here. Thanks ever so much, Tobias. And I'll open it up for conversations with Tanvir and Tobias. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel, um, for, for your lecture. I really enjoyed it. Learned a lot. Um, I think you, you you raised many thought-provoking points that that we will now be able to return to in the next part and and then in the in the Q and A session, which which follows afterwards. I have uh, uh, started to monitor the um, the chat, and um, I haven't seen yet any questions or comments there. So this is an invitation to our. Uh, um, to, uh, to to just post your question in the chat and not forget about it. We will keep them. Uh, we will keep note of them and, and uh, bring them into the discussion a little bit later. I see there is one hand raised, but uh, but but in keeping with our plan, um, perhaps let us move first into into the, the discussion now and um, and then move into the Q and A session that would involve other participants as well. So I can see that uh, Tanvir has already uh, switched on her video, and Divine has done done the same uh, as well, which is great. So, so what will now happen is um, is unscripted, and is also arguably a little bit unplannable. And the whole idea really is to to use what we just heard as, as a starting point for for a conversation among three subject matter specialists. Um, who, who I hope will critically approach the topic and, and what we've heard from from overlapping but but different angles to to further enrich the discussions. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, the, the the part that makes me more most nervous in this because we haven't planned through. The, so the German in me wants to say why didn't we plan it more to the T? But the South African in me says no, it's going to be fine. This is the one and really way of actually dealing with that. So so I'm trust. 
trusting that what what is uh, to come is, is is going to be very exciting now. So I'm uh, inviting Divine and and uh, Tanvi onto the stage, so to speak, and I quickly introduce them here. I'm going to start off with Dr. Divine Fu, who, according to his bio, is a social anth anthropologist from Cameroon and the director, as you heard earlier, of Yuma, the Institute uh, for Humanities here at the University of Cape Town. Uh, his bio says that his works. And I like that his work examines the politics of suffering and smiling amongst urban African youth, the politics of African knowledge production, particularly publishing and the ethics of artificial intelligence in African contexts. He has done uh, work in Cameroon, Botswana, Senegal and South Africa, and I very much uh, welcome him to, to the discussion here today. And then to over to Tan Tanvia Jeva who holds, many of you uh, will know her, she holds an LLB and an LM, LM degree here from UCT and is currently the Legal and Communications Officer at the International Commission of Jurists. Uh, she has served, among other things, uh, many other things, in fact, as a law clerk at the South African Constitutional Court and was the United Nations Delegate at the Youth Assembly, where she was awarded the Resolution Project Fellow for outstanding dedication to making positive change and helping others today and for lifelong commitment to sustainable impact, innovation, collaboration, and social responsibility, which is a great title, even though it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, her research interests are constitutional law and the application of human rights law in a regional context. And I was also hoping to also read intellectual property law somewhere, because as you heard earlier, she also worked at some point, as, as Adi mentioned, as a research assistant um, at the law faculties at PUNIT, which was when we first, first met. So I'm looking forward to that. And I'm inviting you uh, to it. I don't even have an opening question to that because when we very briefly spoke about that yesterday, I had the I had the feeling the discussion is just just starting almost naturally or, or automatically. Perhaps the only thing that I can can say is perhaps Divine can kick us off, and that is uh, where, where I leave it. <laughs> and let's see where this takes us. Uh, thank you, so, uh, Tobias. I was hoping that uh, I, I wouldn't have to kick it off and that I'll have to end it up. But uh, uh, I mean, thank you to the law faculty for organizing uh, this annual lecture and uh, to Tobias for and Gabby for doing a, a lot of the work, uh, but also for Rachel, uh, Rachel for uh, giving such uh, a really uh, thought provoking uh, um, uh, key, I mean, keynote or speech. Uh, uh, on work that uh, uh, you've been doing for some time, uh, but also that you keep on deepening. I think it's always a joy to to listen and see how these ideas, you know, uh, develop. And 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 also thank uh, thank you Tanvir for uh, taking the time to uh, be with me on this platform to engage with uh, Rachel. We we would have loved to all meet face to face as we've all heard, but. Um, you know, uh, the times are what uh, they are, you know. Um, I mean, I should just kick off uh, uh, by uh, uh, first uh, some of the issues that we, we've we all raised and that we all are thinking about, the uh, just having to talk and discuss decoloniality in this space and decolonization, you know, and uh, in, in a space which has its own checkered history and its own relationship with the concept of of decolonization and and here uh, i'm not just talking about the the university in which we are that's uct as a place uh south africa as a country uh but uh, particularly also the law faculty you know uh as as as, as, as a space and it's not just the law faculty at uct but law faculties all across uh, the continent across the world, uh, because as we, as uh, Rachel has rightly indicated, the law has often been the instrument through uh, through which uh, a colonization has embedded itself and has continued, you know, after time. I often uh, I, I laugh when I, I see back in my own home country, many of these lawyers and their capes and their gowns, you know, uh, priding themselves, you know, being in, in, in this space, and uh, uh, while at the same at the same time, lots of other people fighting decolonization. So uh, it, it is it is quite fascinating to be having this conversation in in this space about decolonization because uh, we some of us really think that the law and lawyers continue to hold us back. Um, and then then the second is just you know having a discussion uh, in a space uh, that is also named after uh, uh, people. 
who uh, we would say need to uh, be critically engaged. What does it mean to be talking about, to be having uh, a talk in a place named after Bainat, you know, asked by Bainat lecture and talking about decolonization. So that's something we have to think about quite, 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 quite critically and what kinds of ideas, you know, one, one brings into that uh, space. And also what does it mean to be talking about decolonization uh, funded by an institution that we would consider as, as, as uh, you know, a problematic, especially within a, a South African context, you know. So these questions are quite uh, uh, important, you know, to start off with that we should be aware uh, you know, of this, and also those of us who are participating in the debate, you know, like uh, 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 Rachel you and uh, Tobias, you know, the issues that we would raise, you know, with Tanvir, what does it mean for uh, a white woman to be talking about decolonization? What does it mean for a decolonization lecture to be organized by a German white man? What does it mean for a decolonization uh, a conversation to be had by a Cameroonian, by a Mauritian and stuff like that? So these are really important conversations that really foreground this conversation that we have about uh, uh, decolonizing uh, AI, because this is also about the history of ideas. So, uh, and, and I think you rightly point to that uh, uh, ratio. Uh, so when, when, when one talks about decolonizing uh, uh, artificial intelligence, it is important also to look at the history of the development of this idea itself. And as you have rightly pointed out, on the one side, we have uh, uh, the equation of intelligence and on the other side, artificial. So there is the history of technology itself, which as you have indicated, it grows out of this uh, obsession and this push uh, of, of particular societies, you know, to dominate the world, to dominate economies, to maximize profits and exploit others. We've seen whether with we cannot uh, delink it from the histories of slavery itself and the fact that we stop the um, objectification of humans, you know, and we then turn to machines. Uh, you know, to begin to do the dirty level so we can exploit people further. So it's not about bettering society. It uh, really grows out of a history of just continuing to exploit society, to push society, and also to circumvent uh, a rule. So it, it actually grows out of an unethical context, I would argue. Uh, and, and therefore that raises serious issues about whether one can really decolonize it. And I think I continue to push that uh, we cannot decolonize uh, a, a technology uh, by focusing on the bullets. We have to really focus on the technology of the gun itself, how one constructs this object uh, that one uses for security. Because uh, the history of the idea, the history of a concept, as people like Alicia Mankam, Makamo has indicated, uh, that one, one needs to think about, <clears throat> rethink about the history of um, concepts and scientific ideas. And I think artificial intelligence is one of those. And then technology also is, um, uh, is, 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 the, is the other. So I like to argue that um, artificial intelligence grows out of the need for what I call keyhole masculinities to find ways of you know, hiding their work and hiding themselves. And we can see in those who lead this area, whether it is with the owners of we, we see today that the wealthiest people are those who actually uh, are owners of technology. You know, the wealthiest people are actually people who come out of these keyhole masculinities. You know, those who want to do what I call single erections, who would jump onto the sky for five seconds so that they can become quite happy while we have a very deep pandemic, you know, happening. So uh, there I argue that whatever we say and whatever we do, actually, we cannot really decolonize this technology because it's history, it's practices, you know, it's, it's form, it's intentions. And, and also those who actually develop and create this are already unethical. So it, it comes and um, uh, it, it, the technology is an embodiment of very bad ethics itself. The practices of collecting data, the very fact that it depends on data that was correct, collected already with the most unethical practices, you know, because AI depends on lots of big data. Big data, it's not just data that's collected now, but histories of data and histories of ideas of, of, of data. And the very fact that you, as you've rightly mentioned, we are existing and operating in a context that is so unequal, uh, where a group of people just continue to provide uh, the raw materials and also the labor for those raw materials. And that's why we see all of these AI 
uh, and, uh, and uh, 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 tech companies establishing hubs in Lagos, in, in uh, uh, Accra, you know, in Nairobi, in, in Yaoundé, and all of these places where it's so easy, you know, to develop, uh, 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 to, to find raw materials, a low level, uh, raw level. And we're seeing lots of young people, teenagers, adolescents, uh, becoming coders. We, we, we see lots of, and, and it's funny that we tend to project this as, uh, a kind of a growth and a kind of a development, but which in itself as just deep parts of exploitation where we begin to create new forms of slavery, new slaves and new people whose job is just to uh, participate in this economy as producers, uh, as just uh, a, a, a laborers, you know. And uh, uh, lastly, uh, I, I should say that, you, you, you know, the work that uh, you, you, uh, uh, Rachel is pushing for is, is really key and central. Uh, because unless we are able to develop really ethical frameworks that allow us to think about this technology uh, 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 quite, uh, uh, I mean, uh, as uh, quite properly, we uh, we are just going to reproduce the same problems that we have reproduced. And we see across the continent, every country adopting, everybody uh, adopting this the, uh, uh, this technology. We have not developed the infrastructure, for example. We do not have uh, uh, places to save data. We do not have. Uh, data farms, you know, across this continent. Yeah, that's why you see across the continent uh, uh, people doing driver's licenses in countries where their health data needs to, has to be saved in European countries. You have across the country states that are doing passports who and data that needs to be saved in you know in countries abroad. In fact, lots of countries on this continent we who are doing lots of treasonable acts. Uh, uh, in complicity, you know, with these AI con uh, co uh, companies in the name of, you know, uh, uh, development and progress. And that's why I say and I argue and I, uh, uh, I agree with you that this is uh, a technology that is near impossible uh, to decolonize. Not that we cannot think about it with decolonial tools, uh, but that it is just near impossible to decolonize. Thank you. <laughs> I'm trying to be offhand, but I, I, I just say Tanvir. <laughs> sure, thanks so much, Tobias. And thanks again, Rachel, as well, for your great lecture and divine too, for this great introduction in this conversation. I think I'd, I'd have to agree with a lot of what divine says and also bringing up what I saw in the chat box. I know someone mentioned an echo chamber that they're working in. And I don't want to do that by only agreeing with everything that Divine has said. But in fact, thinking a lot about decolonizing AI has also brought me to this almost pessimistic and cynical view of can we decolonize AI? Because to me, what AI seems as is this power evasive ideology, this power evasive tool that we have almost, and re referring back to what Divine has said, almost something that refuses to take accountability because we cannot attribute it to one sect of people. And to me, tools like that, it, it screams the lack of transparency, the lack of accountability, and the furthest thing from decoloniality, really. So can AI be decolonized? And we go again to this conversation that Devine mentioned earlier that we're having now, which is the three of us sitting down and speaking about decolonization in itself. When Fanon, as you mentioned, um, Rachel, Fanon talks about this violence and he talks about the substitution of the current group of people. And I wonder in an AI context, do we, what do we substitute? Because we're definitely not starting with ground zero with AI, although it seems like quite a recent you know, development for a lot of us. It's not ground zero. It comes from a group of people who've been indoctrinated, who have this certain pattern of thoughts. And most of the time, obviously, people with the most privileged, people with the most access. And going back to what Divine has mentioned as well, almost a tool where most Africans, in fact, are subject and, you know, passive subjects of AI. Data is accumulated from them, but they don't necessarily participate in the creation of AI by their own will. They participate passively because the data is being collected from them. And what does this mean as passive subjects when now a few of us call for decolonization. And in fact, it could be a lot of us, but in proportion to the people who are subjects and who are not active objects of this conversation, how does this decolonization take place? And as Divine mentioned, you know, 
in this space now when I was, you know, reading a bit more about what is my take on decolonization? What school of thought of decolonization do I belong to? I cannot stop thinking about season four. And of course, a lot of us who are alumni, you know, at UCT and a lot of other universities in South Africa, when we think about season four, universities did not have the most welcoming you know, reaction to Seas Must Fall, to decolonization as a concept. I think most academics, in fact, did not. And academia hasn't seemed very receptive to decolonization, apart from the niche of people who are, in fact, you know, specializing in that decolonization. But even then, having to question our own identities within the conversations that we're having, and that goes back to what Divine has mentioned, you know, with us being, you know, from different countries of different races, are we the most well placed to talk about decolonization? or shouldn't we all be in the same room to talk about it? Is it a conversation that involves all of us who get to lead it? But, you know, going back to what I think is the most important for me, Rachel, and I don't want to go all abstract, but just to leave it at that really, is the idea that we are not active participants in the creation of AI. And that is not to say that, of course, as, you know, the, the intellectual native, as Fanon puts it, and I'm sure a few of us are, involved in creating AI and, you know, developing AI. But what does it mean when most of us do not even have access to the internet, you know, on the continent? What, how does that translate into the creation of AI that caters for us, as opposed to a, an AI that targets us and uses us and is used against us and recreates even worse forms of discrimination that we see currently? Thank you. Rachel, do you want to perhaps respond uh, to some of that or reflect? Yeah, um, that would be great. Thank you. And I also just want to pick up on some of the um, really important comments that are, are coming through in the chat. Um, so, Divine and, and Tanvir, you've, you've raised a whole load of really important questions. And one of the most kind of important that's coming out or, or the most um, sort of significant in some ways is is this question of well can AI be decolonized if it's based in such critical colonialist histories and advancing um, the kind of principles and values of a small elite subsection of global society can it ever be decolonized and and it's it's it is it's a hard question to deal with, but it's one we have to respond to. Perhaps AI can't fully be decolonized. I certainly don't think it can, and I think that's really instrumentalist terms to be thinking about. But AI is posing a whole host of challenges, a whole host of challenges around the world that are deeply problematic for the kinds of transformative agendas we are seeking to advance, particularly in places like South Africa. And decolonization gives us a vocabulary with which to help see and articulate some of these problems. So while AI, I don't think, can be decolonized, it needs to be responded to in some way. And decolonization will form part of that kind of suite of ideas with which we can begin to ask the right questions, see the right problems, and involve the people that are truly affected um, on the ground by, by these, by these um, technologies, Tanvir, what you call the, the passive participants of AI. So I think that comes to then the second question that is being raised uh, in different ways in the chat, which is, well, what is the role of law here? So, you know, Divine, as you point out, law has been used uh, as an instrument to advance and support colonialism and slavery historically, and, 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 and is a kind of critical vehicle of advancing patriarchal and, and, and racializing norms. But we are faced with these kind of critical issues of, of AI within this global space that are quite clearly related, although may not be completely due to, but quite clearly related to the fact that AI is not sufficiently regulated, that social media platforms are not news outlets, so don't fall under the laws that we've developed to address journalism, they're platforms. Um, the fact that it 
takes place in this kind of planetary cross-border, cross-jurisdictional way that makes it very hard for data protection authorities, for example, in South Africa, to come down on WhatsApp that is um, domiciled in, in the US. So I think we need to be thinking about what role the law can play. And then we need to be thinking about, well, who is developing that law? What is the principles and ethics upon which those laws are, are based? Who's part of the conversation? How do we empower people to be part of that conversation? And none of these are easy questions. And all of them are deeply, deeply structural. Um, and I think also connects to the point that you're making so well, Tanvir, about how do we become kind of active participants and, and that we is not necessarily the we that is sitting here today, but, but those that, I mean, many people across the African continent are in new forms of indenture and slavery, as Divine, you've spoken about in terms of labelling the data that comes to be part of uh, these AI systems um, in grueling kind of menial, no security and no pay jobs. In fact, it's taking place in kind of refugee camps across the country where big tech is farming out data annotation and data labeling that is, you know, highly kind of sensitive material to, to, to these people in these places. But, but part of it is thinking through, well, if AI is so rampant globally, how do we respond in a way that doesn't just say, well, we, we don't accept it because that doesn't seem to be an answer that's available to us. How instead do we try and build AI that is built from local talent and communities that responds to local needs, that embeds local values. And, and that, as you say, Divine, is, a, is an infrastructure question. It's, it's about where is the data availability? Where is the computing power? Where is the, the kind of networks and internet networks and power networks needed to fuel AI systems that to create an AI system is more env environmentally damaging to f than to fly a plane backwards and forwards from the US however many times. So I think these are deeply complicated questions um, and, and thank you both for, for raising them in such nuanced um, nuanced and deep ways. And, and I think there is much to think about in terms of the role that law can potentially play. Um, but as, as I said, it comes back to, to this idea of who's participating, who's law, who's at the table. Thanks, Tobias. <laughs> Am I handing back to you, Divine? Uh, yes, I think, please, yes, continue <laughs> the conversation. That's how it's supposed to be. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, I mean, Russia, you raised very important uh, uh, questions. Uh, and I, I should respond to them in, in several ways. I mean, um, one is just, it's, it's just to uh, outline that uh, I'm not arguing that AI should be abandoned and that it's not good. Uh, that's very important. Um, and I, you know, there's a tendency, uh, I've also seen a comment in, uh, uh, in, in, in the chat about uh, uh, the, the, the vocabulary of decolonization as uh, born in the ivory towers. Yeah, the university is ivory tower. I, uh, and uh, the, the, the history of the university was an exclusive space. It will always be an exclusive space. The idea that we are going to someday turn the university uh, into a place that is uh, uh, for what we now call uh, a common or popular, it will not happen, it will never happen, because uh, the university continues to produce and reproduce lots of elites, and those who come into the university then begin to uh, enjoy being this exclusive elite. So, and we've seen it over the years. Uh, I mean, decolonization and the debate about decolonization and the university as an elite space began many years and many centuries back. Let's not forget that a lot, many countries on the African continent have more than 60 or 65 years of uh, post uh, colonization experience and the debates with people like Senghor, Mudimbe, uh, Cezanne, lots of others. We are reproducing many of those debates today. So the university will continue to produce elites and people who fight against the systems, but then become to enjoy the systems after. Uh, that, that, that's that's one. And then uh, the I, what I'm arguing is that uh, 
I, I, and, and I'm just building on debates that uh, many scholars have argued, right from uh, post-independence, uh, before independence, and whether you're looking at uh, uh, scholars of post-coloniality, you're looking at especially the people of uh, India who made lots of argue, arguments, whether it's Edward Said, or whether you're looking at feminist scholars who argue that it is important to be able to think through uh, one's experience and build concepts that are grounded in one's own experience and that the personal is political. And whether you're looking at Africans or black scholars across the world or indigenous um, uh, people across the world or people who are located on the margins, that one's conceptual experience, when one is located in a, a power relationship, in a place where hegemonic ideas of being uh, dominate, uh, one necessarily has to orient themselves towards these standards. You know, the, the, the idea of animating objects, it's something that is common in all cultures, in all cultural contexts. In South Africa, you hear a lot about tokoloshis, and, and uh, you, you, you hear all these ideas, people want to always outsource their pain, their experience, their labels to these beings that we don't see. This is part and parcel of every human society. So the, the how we translate concepts, how we translate ideas, how ideas learn in particular places is really key. And that is what we are asking for here, uh, that while this tool is so important, how do we ensure that we build it first in a context that allows us to ground it in concepts that make sense, you know, in particular places. That's it. the other is just to acknowledge and recognize that this is a tool that is born out of exploitation and a tool that is mainly used for exploitation, whose main uh, uh, goal is to accumulate and accumulate capital so people can compete to go up to the sky for five seconds and come back. That's really uh, 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 important. It's a tool of exploitation. Also, the products of these tools are tools of exploitation. The, the products, the uh, minerals that are used to uh, run these tools, computers and all of these come from places like Congo, you know? So it's, it's just so important for us to use the computer for activist work and internet for activist work, but forget that there are people dying in Congo, there are women being raped in Congo, there are lots of things happening in Congo so that we can sit here and freely talk about act, uh, activism. So we, we need to acknowledge all of this. How do we make sure that we, we move into a space where these become really conscious, where the men who work on this uh, uh, on these uh, the technologies are people with very problematic uh, and, and uh, what one would call uh, a misogynist ideas about what it means to explore. Read the biographies, whether you're looking at the biographies of uh, the people in Facebook or the uh, biographies of those in Google, the biographies of uh, you know people in Amazon, you see that misogyny is really key and at the center of this. So how do we ensure that as we move on, we actually acknowledge all of this. And we can only do this by beginning to rethink uh, from our place what these concepts mean uh, in, 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 in our particular localities. I think that's what I'm pushing for Tanvi. <laughs> so. Sorry, I was having some trouble with my mic. Thank you, Divine. And thank you, Rachel, for answering these questions so eloquently as well. Um, I, I, I do note that um, Divine's not saying that we should turn our backs on AI, and I and I realized that maybe that was more coming from me. But <laughs> even at this stage, I have to say I I am not calling for turning our backs on AI. I think I'm just coming from a more skeptical perspective, not only about whether we can decolonize AI, but the tools through which we decolonize AI. Because I understand how we see decolonization itself as a tool. But to me, decolonization is obviously, to me at least, it's a toolbox with many tools. And sometimes we've had the, you know, I mean, at least again, I, again, I think I'm one of the lawyers who are more skeptical about the law than anything else. We often turn to law to decolonize many things, which again brings us back to the law itself not being the most decolonial, you know, history or school of thought in the world. And in fact, you know, what we often, I've, again, while researching, AI and decolonization, I've seen a lot of work being done around um, AI and human rights, as I'm sure Rachel works on this as well. And that has also caused me to think the fact that we, a lot of us think that, you know, if not law, then at least human rights is very decolonial. Human rights, you know, universal rights that we all have. And this is something that really um, rubs me the wrong way because human rights to me, 
you know, aren't universal. Because if you look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights itself, that was signed while many countries were still colonized, you know, and many countries, many people didn't have a say into this declaration of human rights. And in fact, the human rights didn't necessarily apply to them. And even when we're looking more specifically at the African continent, we're in different cultural contexts. A lot of rights do not necessarily apply in the same way. They don't translate in the same way. And the reason I'm I'm going back to this is because the idea while Divine was speaking about, you know, animated objects, it's translating beyond cultures and it's not being something that was just, you know, found now, not something that was done within AI itself. To me came the sort of community, you know, what AI has tried to do and the internet through social media has been this exclusive community, you know, inaccessible to a lot of people, but, you know, accessible just to this elite few, the ones that Divine mentioned that want to go in the sky for five, you know, five seconds and so on, as opposed to communities that we see now around us, communities that often has had the role of, you know, being those law enforcers, although the law wasn't itself, you know, on the ground. And the reason I'm thinking about that is because of Naledi's comment with respect to decolonization being, you know, a school of thought that was made in an ivory tower as much as, you know, many school of thoughts with academia generally. And to me, that is very much true. But at the same time, it also comes from the fact that I think decolonization has been, I want to invent a word, almost academicized, but the concept of decolonization, the idea that, you know, we're rejecting what the West has is trying to bring upon us is not something that's merely academic. It's something that our, you know, our ancestors has lived, have lived through for a very long time, you know, in trying to reject slavery, trying to fight against indentured labor. That was decolonization. But it's just that now we, we maybe have, we have it also in academia. We have it where Professor Modiri tells us before we burn the books, maybe we should stop and argue against those books and then maybe afterwards burn them. You know, now we bring in the intellectual component of decolonization. I would argue that it's not necessarily only an academic thing. Um, I would argue that, in fact, in practice, it has been done many, many centuries ago. It has been done by communities in their actual rejection of the West and Western values. But I also want, Rachel, hopefully, to address the fact that, um, or, or maybe to answer this question that I have, is that I think a lot of us have dismissed that AI is only a Western thing, you know, because we tend to see science which is erroneous, by the way, a, a lot of you will know this, we tend to see science as a Western thing when it's clearly not. And that has also caused some debate a few years ago, the fact that, you know, science has only been, has only come this far because a lot of developments that weren't done, you know, in the West. And we, how do we then tackle this myth that AI is not in fact a product of only the West, but yet still reconcile ourselves with the fact that AI is still colonial, you know? despite the fact that science is not something that is inherently Western. Thank you. Thank you, Tanvir. Can I, Tobias, can I quickly respond to, to Tanvir's last point? Because I think that's that's really interesting. And then perhaps we can open because there's a number of great questions in the chat too. So, yeah, I mean, as, as Divine said, the idea of artificial intelligence, of, of creating an animate object uh, of manufacturing life is an idea as old as time and an idea that exists in cultures around the world. Um, now, AI is not so much about creating artificial life as it is about having these advanced statistical systems that can predict behavior and depends on a particularly uh, disciplined idea of, of data and data systems. So I think, no, AI is not necessarily Western, but some of the problematics associated with it that I'm trying to articulate are born from Western colonialism and that history of statistics and Francis Galton and how you control colonial populations and the kind of race science that really is distinctly Western. Today, as I mentioned at one point, there are these kind of exciting emerging indigenous AI communities where they're building similar constructed AI tools, you know, vast amounts of data, whether it's natural language processing or um, more numerical data sets. Um, 
by Indigenous communities that seek to embed more local values. A lot of them are now being picked up by uh, big tech companies that want to come in and, and buy these and kind of subsume them within the kind of massive uh, global arrangement of, of, of AI. But the biggest kind of issue that the West is facing is that of Chinese technology, um, which is not the West, the Chinese AI technology. Um, and in fact, the West is very fearful of being colonized by Chinese technology that embeds Chinese values rather than what they would see as their Western democratic values. So, so that's really, really interesting. And it's something that we must think carefully about when the biggest investment of AI technologies in Africa is coming from China. It's something like 90% and even kind of free AI infrastructure and facial recognition uh, um, technologies and, and, and related kind of digital ID systems are, are being sold to African governments by the Chinese. So that's why I sort of was speaking about this idea of the imperial power is very hard to locate. Yes, that, that's true, but there are still very clear histories between what colonialism made possible and the ways in which AI power operates through those possibilities that, that colonialism created um, today. Um, so yeah, I'm going to hope that answers a little bit and, and we've got time to respond to some of the wonderful uh, comments coming through in the chat. Um, and Jason Lewis in Canada is one of those really important scholars on Indigenous AI. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's first of all, it's amazing how quickly time goes. If uh, if you're having fun, I suppose it's 14 minutes uh, um, be, before the hour. And I want to want to stop here for a moment and already uh, thank again our our speakers uh, for for first Rachel. Uh, the lecture at the beginning, but also with what has exactly panned out how I had envisioned it and hoped for, but obviously you couldn't couldn't be sure that it that it pans out in in that way. That conversation that we just had, which was 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 lovely. Special thanks to to Tanvir who uh, is in Mauritius, and I think it's approaching 9 p.m. <laughs> there at the moment, They're holding up pretty good. Um, now. Um, um, some of you have, have uh, thrown a spanner in the works in the way that you've already started to address the, un the questions in the chat and, and uh, it, um, I, I wasn't fully uh, able to follow um, which uh, questions we have now already addressed and which ones are not. But before we get to these questions, perhaps, I want to just uh, just also acknowledge that uh, that I've seen in the chat that uh, that we have in the audience a student from the from 1950, John Hunt, who was and I hope I pronounced that right, who was actually in Professor Beinert's class in the early 1950s, and he and he asked whether he could not share some of his personal experience with the professors in the early 50s, and I think that's a lovely idea, but I would would say that is also a lovely way of of, of finishing up today. So perhaps before I then hand back to the Dean uh, for the official closing of the event, we uh, we switch uh, the microphone on for John to speak to for us for anything between really a minute or three uh, to share some of his experiences there. Um, and um, between now and 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 then, say in about like ten minutes time or so, we we try to engage with uh, with some of these questions that that we are seeing seeing in the chat. I would ask the speakers to also look at the questions if they can and pick those perhaps that are particularly relevant for them. Otherwise, I have listed them here. That's why I'm looking to the left hand side here on my screen. I have all kind of copied and pasted them into a Word document here. But maybe we can start off with uh, with giving you an opportunity to, to pick. There's, uh, there's a lot of thank yous. Uh, certainly also in the chat. I want to acknowledge that, but there are also some very, uh, very valuable and, uh, and and justified questions. In fact, I had prepared an icebreaker question uh, in case nobody would be forthcoming uh, with a question, which I obviously hold back to myself because it's not a great question compared to what we uh, what we what we see here. But it was along the same lines. Well, what can the law really then do? What is the what is a practical kind of way to uh, to 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 deal with law and policy then in that space? But I keep this back. Some of these questions seem to go into the same direction, but are a little bit deeper than that. So um, perhaps reverse order. Who spoke now? 
last, um, I can't even remember, maybe I just, uh, Divine, do you want to pick one or you seem to be happy with uh, with what I just proposed? Is there any question that was raised in the in, in the chat um, that, uh, that interested you in particular? In fact, I, I pointed you out first in the other part of that conversation as well. I'm mindful of that. <laughs> I was I was laughing. I was laughing because you keep pointing me out. So. I'm sorry, maybe I I take yeah. that back and I and I play it over to Tanvir. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'm sorry, my mic. Thanks, thanks, Divine, for passing over the ball. And thanks to you, to Tobias. I expected it from you, Tobias, not from Divine. But that's all right. I will go with um, Dr. Ren's question about laws because, I don't know, it just seems like the easier question to go with. Can you all hear me? Is that all right? Okay, great. Thank you. So the question is, how can laws be used to decolonize AI? What laws can be used to decolonize AI? Now, um, I'm just going to quickly answer it by a bit of a an anecdote, I've been working recently on critical race theory and, you know, the right to equality and expression. And it's something that I struggled with a lot in combating, you know, judicial bias and on the bench, how do we, you know, try and get, um, you know, this inherent bias that a lot of judges will have and all judges have, how do we combat that? And the reason I'm thinking about this is because AI to me seems like the same kind of beast that we're tackling. And inherent bias that exists, but also a bias that one can't see, right? So it's almost something that's not really tangible. But the reason um, I'm bringing this up right now is because the same way in which that I kind of answered that question in the paper, which seems like, you know, the most, the most basic way really, but to replace the people who are working on AI, but rather not only substitute, but also involve more people of color working on AI, for the colonial thinkers working on AI to get a better idea, better representation. And the reason I'm saying this is because I'm sure a lot of you have watched this documentary on Netflix. I kind of forgot the name now. I'm sure Rachel will know about it. There's a documentary about, you know, the use of AI in security and the fact that um, AI in its infringements of privacy and in the work that it does with security targets black people more. And as and, and Rachel mentions this in her lecture as well, the likelihood that um, AI finds black people to commit crime, which is not true. And the fact that, you know, there were some struggles in the UK where a few people refused to have their data taken, refused to have the cameras, you know, see the image because that would lead you. And for me, that points to something that the lady in this documentary, I'll find the name and put it in the chat box, did was motivate to government to pass legislation on you know the fact that this AI is used in this way. So monitoring AI and you know really hammering onto the right to privacy to begin with, and in addition to the right to non-discrimination, of course. But I think the first step is really the right to privacy because we know that all of these human um, rights infringements happen on a whole scale basis to everyone. Um, it doesn't happen in an indiscriminate way because AI targets people of color more. So I would say in terms of laws that can be used to decolonize AI, we look a lot at, at international law and international frameworks. I know right now that's being worked on. And I think another commentator mentioned this earlier that the EU is trying to work on an act right now. So that's where I would start. But otherwise, in a, in a local area, I would to privacy because to me, that's the most, you know, an eminent, prominent one. And otherwise, I'd move to the right to equality. But um, I'm sorry, Tobias, I, I know this is your role as a moderator, but I'd like to hand over to Rachel to also maybe touch on this question because I think she might have something to add, especially because of the lecture she just gave. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Tambir. And I actually did want to respond to a couple of questions that indicate something around kind of policy transfer, whether that's the pop here that we have here that, 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 that's based on the EU's GDPR, or the AI Act that's now come out um, for public consultation in, in the EU. So I, I'm not so sure that the law can help us decolonize AI. I think that the law will help us and can help us if done well, lots of provisos there, in addressing some of the harms that we see coming out of artificial intelligence and some of the structural concerns, such as the monopolies and so forth, um, that AI 
it is built on and depends on. Um, in terms of this issue of policy transfer, that really is the question of not taking laws that exist elsewhere and that were created in a different context for here, where we are dealing with a very different context and they're not necessarily based on the principles that communities here hold important. In terms of artificial intelligence, we don't understand the full degree of the impacts and implications it has for very diverse African societies. There is so much work that needs to be done in building an evidence base that leads us to an assessment of the kinds of policy or legal responses that we may need to address some of those harms. We simply don't know enough. So I think that there's much work and listening and thinking and understanding that needs to be done to understand how AI is affecting communities across the continent in very many different ways, including how it may be of benefit to some people, if, if indeed it is. Um, and just quickly on the right to privacy, that is, that's also contested, right? And that's also a value that is not always the top value and priority in African societies, and rightly so. I mean, we saw with the Facebook's response to Myanmar that it was using the right to privacy to protect the information that it was holding about the the, the speech of, of the kind of inflammatory speech of, of the Myanmar officials in, in those circumstances. So I think that's what Western ethics often fails to do, is help us negotiate when we have contested and conflicting principles and how we think through them and how we prioritize what's important. Um, and just quickly on human rights, I, I completely agree. I mean, it's dependent on what, what we think the human to be, and that's of, often a very normative and racialized idea. I think it helps us get a little further, particularly in African societies where there are newer constitutions that are built out of more representative post-colonial discussions, not fully, but questions affirming the centrality of human dignity is important. Looking at things like Article 19 is the right to be free from domination from one group over another, that's critically important and comes out of the history of colonialism. So human rights, I think, helps us a little bit more than other more normative legal frameworks, but but not necessarily and certainly not enough. Uh, but I don't think decolon uh, I don't think law is the vehicle through which decolonization of, of AI will be achieved. But I think law needs to play its part if the right people and the right principles and values are behind it. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. I, I said I was just going to keep quiet, yeah. Uh, but let me uh, let, let me just say, like Chinua Achebe would say, that uh, my colleagues have said everything, uh, and that I agree with everything. Uh, but I, I should I should add that um, uh, add where Rachel has ended. The, the the key question is what kind of human uh, we want to be, what kind of human society we want to build, ultimately. That is the question, uh, and and that should drive how we relate to innovation, to technology, to or to anything that we uh, we borrow. And many of the questions do point to that. You know, it's what kind of law, because law uh, creates society, and and law also archives society, uh, and 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 law also uh, has uh, tends to create this kind of DNA that is passed on from one place, one society to the other. It remains, sometimes it remains constant, you know. Uh, and, and we really have to take that seriously. And it's the same thing about human rights, you know. Uh, well, like uh, Rachel rightly pointed out, what is, what is it to be human? You know, I often say that we uh, uh, try to talk about human rights in a world in which we are not considered human. We've just seen with the vaccines that uh, if you uh, uh, test something in South Africa, uh, the world can ban you. But if you have other people uh, infected in Belgium, in UK and the US, you don't need to be banned because there you are human, but here you are something that we, that we cannot even name, you know? So, and, and, and that's it. So when we say that this, this thing is part of us, we need to be aware of all of this. this all of these things are, in, uh, are interconnected. 
uh, a person who uh, thinks that you are not human enough to travel to their country, but think that you are human enough to play with this technology. So these contradictions are very important to take uh, into consideration when we talk about the law and how whether the law can solve this, whether we should be tending to human rights, whether we should be tending to uh, 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 to different regulations. All of these are important. What does it mean to be human? How do we build better moral societies? How do we build societies where we care uh, for each other uh, better? But that can only happen if at the core of it, we think that our job and the reason why we exist is to protect other people and to ensure that we build better relations with other people. If that does not drive it, we will continue to build technology that is about exploitation, taking advantage, accumulating and doing many other uh, uh, stuff. And AI, I think, uh, is, is not different. And just to uh, end, to be honest with uh, uh, some of the issues that we, we, we started off with, what it means to be talking about decolonization in this space and to be talking about decolonization in relation uh, to either by now or to the law faculty or to UCT or to all of us. These are important questions that uh, uh, we need to constantly raise every time we have these conversations. It doesn't mean that we should not have this conversation or that we do not have the right to have this conversation, or we are not the right persons to have these conversations. But we always have to reflect on, in the, on, the, about, on the ways in which we uh, are complicit in these uh, 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 power relations and, uh, and, and domination and, 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 and exploitation, even when we are good intentioned, you know. Um, and, and I think that's the, that's the point. So these people will all be great people, but we are people who are constantly being interrogated as time goes on. One time we are great, another time we are problematic. So, and thank you again, Rachel. This is really great. And Tanvi and Tobias, uh, really great conversation. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Divine. So it is it is now just after 7 p.m. South African time. And uh, as, as much as I would love to continue this conversation, I think it's time to conclude this event for now. I feel that we that we were able to cover quite a bit of ground. I'm also mindful of the fact that we may have not gotten to to to, to all or most of the questions actually in a satisfactory kind of way. If you if you're one of those who had posted a question in the chat that we didn't get to, to tackle fully and you feel hard done by, by the fact that uh, what you think is an important question wasn't addressed uh, <clears throat> adequately. What I will be doing is I'm going to put my email address into the chat um, with all the risk that this comes with. Uh, but uh, I just want to give the um, open up the channel of conversation for those who want to uh, stay in touch. And um, maybe we can even organize a follow up event. Maybe I can coerce Rachel and Tanvir and, and Divine to, to do something similar. Again, maybe under the full rubric of the Law Tag Lab in, in, in 2020-22. Uh, maybe we can even have some of those who have posed questions and who seem to be very knowledgeable to actually run, run a webinar for us and, and address these questions themselves. I'm not even sure whether there's answers to, to all the questions that were posed yet. So, and, and that might be also the, the ex exciting part of that. Now, what I had planned is that uh, to give that microphone to, to the student um, of, uh, of uh, Professor Ben Weinert, and uh, that student has since disappeared from the audience. So it's no, no longer possible, unless someone tells me in the chat that this, this has changed again, but I checked about two or three minutes ago. And John had indeed uh, left uh, the building, I wanted to say. So, so unfortunately, we cannot come back to that. Um, I would very much like to now go outside of the mood court and have a glass of wine with, uh, with the participants, but this is not to be. Uh, I want to thank once again the, the, the speakers, uh, particularly Rachel, obviously, who has spent a lot of time in preparing for today and, and, uh, and kicked us really off with, with, uh, with an excellent presentation, but also to to turn via and divine for, for the intellectual input that, that really got us going in terms of the conversation that, that followed. That's really all from, from my side for today. I'm going to hand over back to the Dean for an official closure of this event. Good night. Thank you, Tobias. I, I won't take up uh, much time uh, other than to thank you for the concept uh, of the uh, lecture. Um, it's something that is new that we haven't, we haven't hosted it in this way. Um, and it's worked extremely well. 
uh, so much appreciated and and Gabby for arranging this uh, you put in a lot of work uh, into the hybrid mode uh, which didn't happen uh, still we have had it uh, um, and and once again Ratio, it's nice to see you that you're doing so well and uh, for an excellent um, a talk you've given here, uh, truly inspirational. Uh, Tanvia, um, um, as usual, um, it's nice to see you and uh, thanks for pioneering this work, um, uh, working with Tobias in these new areas, we truly appreciate. I haven't met uh, you, Divine. It's good to see you. Uh, I hope we'll meet uh, very soon uh, as the conditions uh, get better with the pandemic, uh, hopefully uh, next year. Um, it was nice to see you and also thank you for the contribution. Uh, colleagues and participants, um, we really appreciate. I know some have left, uh, but uh, many are still here. Some of them are colleagues in the faculty, in the university, but there are also many alumni um, that have seen uh, supporters of the faculty and many other uh, people, um, uh, including students who joined us. We truly appreciate uh, um, your support and also for attending this. As Tobias has said, uh, the conversation can continue. Uh, this is an area, um, especially law and technology, that we are working on. We would like to specialize in more and develop capacity uh, and reach um, um, out uh, to the continent as a whole and beyond. So have a nice day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye.